Imagine an engine capable of flying 10 times the speed of sound. Faster than a jet, lighter and more efficient than a rocket, this is the scramjet. For decades, scramjets have promised to be the next evolutionary step in human flight, propelling hypersonic planes anywhere in the world within a few hours. Well, we're not actually sure how fast they can go. Maybe we can get them to 14, maybe 15 times the speed of sound. Conventional jet engines are limited to three or four times the speed of sound. And rockets are weighed down with tanks of liquid oxygen. So it's little surprise the likes of NASA, Boeing, and the US Air Force have pumped hundreds of millions of dollars into their scramjet research. But with comparatively loose change, Australia is punching well above its weight. Here at the University of Queensland, a world-leading team of researchers is preparing to launch their unique design into space, bringing the promise of this technology one step closer to reality. It's called Scramspace, a 1.8-meter-long scramjet designed to operate at eight times the speed of sound. In September, Professor Russell Boyce will lead his team to the Andoya rocket range in Norway, 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. There, they'll put scram space to the test. What's remarkable about a scramjet engine is not what's inside it, but what isn't. This is the actual engine. That's where the exciting stuff happens inside. But there's no moving parts, no compressor blades, no pistons. That's right, it's essentially just a pipe. <laughs> You've made an incredibly sophisticated pipe by the looks of things. Exactly. It's an empty pipe flying at eight times the speed of sound. A typical scramjet relies on the supersonic airflow that rams into its inlet. As the inlet narrows, the air is compressed, making it hot enough to ignite fuel injected into the combustion chamber. And from there, it works just like a rocket. But with the airflow supersonic throughout the process, it's been compared to trying to light a match in a hurricane and keep it burning. It sounds to me like a scramjet's more like using the hurricane to light your match. What you're trying to do actually is light the hurricane. <laughs> That's why Scram Space includes a homegrown innovation. They'll inject the fuel earlier in the inlet. We were looking at two and a half kilometers per second flow speed um, through the engine. At two and a half kilometers per second, it's pretty hard to inject the fuel, mix it, and burn within a few microseconds. So if we can inject fuel before the entrance of the combustion chamber and give it some time to mix with the air, then you have a chance of actually getting it to ignite and burn inside the combustion chamber at these high speeds. So over here... But designing the inlet poses a dilemma. Squeeze too hard and the scramjet slows down. Open too wide like the scram space does and the air won't get hot enough. The solution is to swallow shock waves, creating hot ignition points in the combustion chamber. So basically, without those shock waves in there, the fuel's not going to ignite. That's correct. Earlier this year, international research got a boost when the X-51A Wave Rider performed the longest scramjet flight to date. Reaching Mach 5, it traveled 425 kilometers in just over six minutes. In comparison, Scram Space is a flying science experiment to help compare the team's research on the ground with what actually happens at Mach 8 in the air. Any form of aerospace system, you can design it on the ground, you can do your computer simulations, you can do wind tunnel tests. Ultimately, you have to go to the air. It's the most ambitious flight experiment undertaken by the university since 2002, when the High Shot program beat NASA to perform the first successful test flight of a scramjet. The University of Queensland team was back at Woomera. Their budget was still so tight, they stood the precious payload on a stack of old paperbacks before nursing it in the back of a ute on the way to the launch pad. The university's aim is to help provide Australia with access to space. Ultimately, we'd like to have a scramjet as part of a satellite launch system. If we can do that, we can drastically reduce the cost of putting a satellite into orbit. We could possibly even halve the cost. On launch day, rockets will boost scram space to an altitude of 80 kilometers, where unlike Australian flights to date, it will detach and become a free-flying scramjet. Momentum will carry it to 340 kilometers above the Earth, ready for its hypersonic swan dive. My role in the Scram Space project is to take the, the vehicle once it's left the atmosphere and 
turn it over exo-atmosphere. So when it comes back in, it's pointing the right way. Did you say exo-atmosphere? Exo-atmosphere, outside the atmosphere. <laughs> you guys really talk like that? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Scram space is fully automated, so Michael's control algorithms have just eight minutes to get the job done, using four cold gas thrusters. I have to de-spin the vehicle, because it'll be spinning on the way up on the rocket. Uh, and then I have to take out any, what they call, nutation, which is a, a wobble. So we take out nutation, we de-spin it, and then we finally push it over. The scramjet itself can only handle a small range of angle of attack. So at two degrees or more, uh, the scramjet suddenly doesn't work anymore because we need to ram as much air through the middle of that scramjet as possible. Well, the main challenge is really managing the heat. This scramjet will get hot very, very quickly, up to a temperature where it will basically melt. You have to be able to store the heat into the structure of this, but this thing also has to be very light. So it's only through a very smart design that you can achieve that. The critical test period will begin about 30 kilometers above the Earth. Traveling at Mach 8, or about 2.5 kilometers per second, the engine will ignite, enabling the key measurement of thrust relative to drag. That's really the first time we'll be doing that. So I think that's, that will be considered as, a, as a, quite a major achievement. The test period will last just three seconds before the scramjet's kamikaze mission goes up in flames and it falls into the sea. That's three years of work for just three seconds of data. But compared with shock tunnel testing on the ground, it's an eternity. 20 years of millisecond experiments here at the university has produced just 20 seconds of total test time. And this is the most used tunnel in the world. Yeah, that worked. A few seconds is a very, very good start. In that time, we get a tremendous amount of data and tremendous insight into Hypersonic physics, hypersonic combustion. How exactly will we make these vehicles fly in the coming decades? Scram Space has a launch window of two weeks in September, and we'll let you know how it goes. And just in case you were wondering... So how soon after this test can I buy my ticket for a two-hour flight to London? I'll sell you a ticket tomorrow. <laughs> How much you, does it cost? You probably, uh, it'll cost you quite a lot. It probably won't be usable for 40 years, 50 years, maybe a lot more. 